Okay, so let's get into the next topic, which will be colligative properties. This is sort of an interesting topic to talk about, I think, because um, you'll see things in your everyday life that follow colligative properties, and you'll start to understand the theory behind it and sort of understand why some things are done the way they are. Okay, so in order to talk about colligative properties, we need to bring a few things with us. So one thing we need to remember is mole fraction. Um, we'll be calculating the mole fractions of solvents. We'll get into that in just a minute. And the other thing we need to bring is molality. So remember, molality is the moles of the solute over the mass of the solvent in kilograms. Okay? And so we'll need that when we get into um, sort of later on in the colligative properties. For the first one, though, we'll need mole fraction. So what exactly is a colligative property? So a colligative property or colligative properties are just the properties of a solution that depend only on the amount of solute particles present and not on the actual identity of the solute. Okay, so we care only about the number of solute particles and not on their identity. Sorry, that looks a little sloppy. Okay, so only on the number of the particles, not on their identity. Uh, so the four that we'll talk about are vapor pressure lowering, boiling point elevation, melting point depression, and osmotic pressure. And so these first three are pretty much self-explanatory. They're exactly what they sound like. And the first one we'll get into is vapor pressure. Uh, so let's just remind ourselves what vapor pressure is. So if we take a volatile liquid, or any liquid for that matter, and we place it into a sealed container, and we measure the amount of force generated by the gas on top of the liquid. That's our vapor pressure. Okay? And when we say a volatile solvent or a volatile liquid, what do we mean? So we just mean a liquid where the molecules will go from liquid phase to gaseous phase very quickly. Okay, so a volatile liquid would have a very high vapor pressure, at least compared to a non-volatile liquid. And the main thing we're talking about here is vapor pressure lowering. So what exactly do I mean by that? Well, on the left, we have a liquid at equilibrium. So just like the one inside of this flask where we might be measuring the uh, vapor pressure. So we have a liquid that's been placed in the sealed container and allowed to reach equilibrium. So if you remember back to when we first started this chapter, we talked about dynamic equilibrium. Okay, and that, remember, is just that the rate of the molecules leaving the liquid to the gas is equal to the rate of the gas molecules entering the liquid. Okay, so we have a happy equilibrium for this liquid. So there's gas, a, a amount of gas sitting on top of it. Okay, and what happens now if we start to add a non-volatile solute? So something that doesn't transition from liquid to a gas so easily. Okay, and here we've represented the volatile solvent with the blue spheres and the red spheres are a non-volatile solute. Okay, so what happens? So we put the non-volatile solute in and now we've disturbed this equilibrium. Okay, so we've altered the equilibrium, we've altered the concentration of the solvent by adding a solute. Okay, what ends up happening is that the equilibrium has to make some new equilibrium, so it has to reestablish itself. So since we've disturbed it, we've altered the equilibrium, but now it will reestablish an equilibrium, and it so happens to be that the new equilibrium, the vapor pressure of that new equilibrium, is lower than the original vapor pressure. Okay, so we don't have to get into so much about exactly why this occurs. We just understand the result of the disturbance of the equilibrium, or the result of disturbing the equilibrium, by the non-volatile solute, it results in that the vapor, the vapor pressure of the solution is lower than the original vapor pressure of the solvent. Okay, and this is governed by Raoult's law. Okay, so Raoult's law tells us that the vapor pressure of a volatile solvent above a solution containing a non-volatile solute is proportional to the solvent's concentration in the solution. So notice here, the key word here, the solvent's concentration kind of interesting, right? We didn't say anything about the solute. Okay, and our equation is that the pressure of the solution, or the vapor pressure of the solution, 
is equal to the mole fraction of the solvent times the original vapor pressure of that solvent. So P naught, the original vapor pressure. Okay, and so this key term here, the, the mole fraction of the solvent, this will be the moles of the solvent over the total moles of the solution. So don't get confused and calculate the solute mole fraction because that's not going to give us the right answer. Okay, we want to calculate for the actual solvent. Okay, so we're measuring how has the concentration of the solvent been disturbed. So here's a question for us. So it says the vapor pressure of water at 25 degrees C is 23.76 millimeters of mercury. The question wants to know, what is the vapor pressure of a solution made from one mole of glucose and 15 moles of water at the same temperature? And it gives us a note here that glucose is a non-volatile solute. Okay, so we just pull out our Rowlett's Law equation. So P is equal to the mole fraction times the original vapor pressure. And first thing we have to do is calculate the mole fraction of the solvent. And in this case, the solvent is the water. Okay, so remember we're calculating the mole fraction of the solvent and not of the solute. And they've been nice enough with this question to go ahead and give us the noted number of moles. If they had instead given us um, grams, for instance, the mass, we would have to convert to moles first. But since they told us 1 mole and 15 moles, we can easily cal calculate the mole fraction. Okay, so then we just take our mole fraction, which in this case is 0 0.938, and we multiply that by our constant. Okay, so I didn't mention this, but this original vapor pressure, these are just a constant. So you have to look this up or it will be given. Okay, or I could ask you to calculate it, giving enough information. <coughs> okay, so notice what we're doing here. So why are we measuring or why are we calculating the mole fraction of the solvent? Okay, so what we're doing is since we know that the vapor pressure goes down when we add a solute. So if we didn't have this term, then this would just be a factor of one. Okay? We wouldn't be lowering the vapor pressure at all. So what we've done is we've used this fraction to essentially calculate the percentage, or calculate, in other words, calculate the solvent concentration. And so what that does is it gives us a fraction of our normal vapor pressure. Okay, so by measuring how much we've disturbed the solvent, in other words, how much we've lowered the concentration of the solvent, by what percentage, or by what fraction, from that, if we multiply it by our original vapor pressure, what we're saying is, this is how much this fraction, or we're taking this fraction of the original vapor pressure. Okay, so we're lowering it based on the ratio of solute and solvent. Okay, but it's just a pretty simple you know, three-variable equation, nothing too complicated, but it has a big impact. Okay, so here's for one for you to try. So suppose 651 grams of ethylene glycol, and they gave us a formula and a formula mass, and it tells us this is a non-volatile solute. And it was dissolved in 1.5 kilograms of water, and they tell us this is a around a 30% solution, which is commonly used as antifreeze. Okay, but it wants to know what is the vapor pressure of the water over the solution at 90 degrees C. Okay, and it, so it gives you a note here that says the vapor pressure of the water at 90 degrees C is 525.8 millimeters of mercury. Okay, and this temperature is only relevant to let us know that this is the right constant to use. Okay, so pause the video, give this one a try, and see what you come up with, and we'll go over it together. Okay, so let's take a look at this one. Um, I'm going to try using my notebook program again. I'm actually using a different recording software this time, so hopefully this will work for us. Um, this gives us a lot more room. Okay, so 
the first thing I like to do with problems like this is just to write down the things that we know. So collect everything you know, and then you can figure out what it is you need to calculate. So the first thing, they gave us some information about ethylene glycol, and I'm just going to abbreviate this EG. So they told us we have 651 grams, and they told us that it was 62.1 grams per mole. And we know this is going to be our solute. Okay, so what else do we know? Next thing is we have water. And they gave us 1.5 kilograms of water. And they don't tell us this, but we can calculate our molar mass for water. Easy enough. Okay. And what else do we know? We know the constant for water will be 525.8 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so far so good. And we're looking for the vapor pressure. So we know we need Rowlett's law. So we'll say P of the solution. So they have solution out of just the water. It's equal to the mole fraction of water times P not for H2O. Okay, so the first thing we need to do is we need to calculate our mole fraction. So they gave us mass, so what do we have to do first? We have to use our molar masses to convert these to moles. So we'll start with the ethylene glycol. So we had 651, that's right, isn't it? Yep, this plain old 651 grams of ethylene glycol. And I'll just again write EG just to be easy. Okay, and now we need to use our molar mass. So for every one mole, there's 62, that doesn't look great, does it? There are 62.1 grams. Okay, so if I calculate this, you should come up with something close to 10.48 moles. Okay, so now I know the moles of ethylene glycol, and let's just label this so we don't lose track of it. Always good to put a label when you can. Okay, the next thing, we need to convert water. So we have 1.5 kilograms. Okay, so first thing, we know that for every one kilogram, there's 1,000 grams. Those are Gs. Okay, then our molar mass, we said that for every one mole, there's 18.02 grams. Okay, so that should give us our molar mass. Oh, not 100, there should be 1,000 grams, duh. 1.5 times 1,000 divided by 18.02. So this gives us 83, and I got 83.2. Okay, so that's how many moles of water we have. Okay, so now we have everything we need to plug into our equation. So we just have to set up our mole fraction. Now remember, we're calculating the mole fraction of the solvent, so of water. Okay, so we need to set up set this equation up this way. So the mole fraction of H2O is equal to 83.2 over 10.48 times, I'm sorry, plus, not times, plus, we want the total, 83.2. Okay, and that will give us our mole fraction. So we have 83.2 divided by 10.48 plus 83.2. So this gives me a mole fraction of 0 0.89. Um, let's see, we have at least three sig figs everywhere. So let's carry this all the way to all the way to the third digit. Okay, so now we can just plug back into our equation. So we'll say the pressure of the solution is equal to our mole fraction, 0 0.888, times whatever our original, so this number, 525.8 millimeters of mercury, 
And from this, I come up with, so let's say 0.888 times 525.8, which will give you 466, uh, let's keep three sig figs, and that will be millimeters of mercury. Okay, and it went down. So if we compare and do a little ration, uh, you know, a sanity check here. So we know that vapor pressure should go down. And we went from 525 down to 466. We did add a significant amount of water or of ethylene glycol. Um, so this makes sense. Okay, so our answer is probably good.